Well, welcome everyone to our Inside the Box lecture series. This is the last lecture of this semester and we have a wonderful guest. We have to thank Jimmy Calhoun uh, for our introduction to Thaddeus. Um, and we're very excited about this. The topic of the semester and last semester too was interior design and the art of rendering space. And it came, came out of my curiosity about other people designing space, designing buildings, designing landscapes, things that we do, but yet they don't necessarily study the same things we study. So I was just really curious and talked to Jimmy about it. And thus this, this group of speakers came from, from him and I'm very, very grateful. So we're very excited about learning about strange new worlds tonight. Um, Thaddeus, Andrades is a digital artist and educator who grew up and works in New York City. He has close to a decade of experience working professionally as a 3D artist on commercials and music videos, architectural visual, visualization, and art installations. He worked as a creative director at Shoko Visual Virtual Construction Lab, where he led a team in creating animations, VR, software tools, real-time training simulations, and various R&D projects. Most recently started Aziel Arts, an art studio and academy with the mission of supporting digital artists with practical skills to reach their creative and professional goals. So Thaddeus, welcome. Thanks so much, Carol. Thank you, Gina, as well. Thank you for having me on this uh, talk. I'm pretty excited. This is new for me to speak to people who don't necessarily have my background, but who I feel a lot of affinity with because um, we use very similar tools and we build very similar things just for slightly different applications. So I'm really excited to nerd out with you tonight and share with you some stuff that I am really interested in, uh, specifically procedural content generation. So I'm going to go ahead and share my screen really quick here. So we can get started. Oh, right. So procedural content generation, how to spawn emergent design. So this sounds super nerdy as a topic. And some of you probably are familiar with this idea of proceduralism or procedural modeling, procedural design. We're going to break it down. And my hope is that by the end of this, I can kind of share with you why I'm excited about it and how I'm using it. And perhaps uh, this might inform or inspire you to uh, think about how you approach design um, and apply this to that as well. So I'm going to click on my slides so they start working here. OK, so thank you for that introduction. I didn't realize I was going to be introduced, but uh, here's me again. I am a digital and mixed media artist. And just to kind of chart my journey a little bit, because I think that that will help me explain why this is interesting to me. So I left school as a 3D artist. I went to the computer animation department at SVA, and I started uh, working on character animation. And I was a 3D generalist for a few years, and then a creative director. Um, but as I developed as a 3D artist, I just started to get drawn towards environment art, specifically as a focus. I just really loved the, the way of telling story and communicating through an environment devoid of character just was really interesting to me. And so that I've sort of beelined in that direction as a digital artist. And um, most recently, um, as Carol mentioned, I started a company called Asial Arts, which is all about teaching that and supporting digital artists with tools and stuff to uh, to make their own um, digital art and environments. And, and but I'll, I'll mention that a little bit more of that later. But this all kind of evolved out of my personal love for the natural world. I think nature is awesome. I love just especially really natural environments that feel really uh, powerful, that have a, a weight to them. When you enter them, you just feel the, the, this, this overwhelming power of nature, whether it's a, a storm or it's just an, an incredibly epic vista like this or or just like the, the density of foliage in a jungle. There's something about that that has always spoken to me. And I have discovered over time 
as a digital artist that this is what inspires me to make things. So this is my source. This is the source of my inspiration. So I love nature and I have over the years been starting to kind of identify as a student of nature in my own in my own work um, on the computer because the, it really is the source of everything we do. Nature is the best teacher. You know, our the colors we use, the textures we use, the the, the structures we use are all sourced really from nature in some way, shape, or form. Whether it's the material or just the actual observations that we make of the structures of these canyons or you know, the way jungles over overflow or just it's all this is what we observe as humans and so we take it into ourselves and it comes out in our design and in our in our art and so this is something i just have just become obsessed with <laughs> being in nature getting inspired by it and sort of channeling it into my digital artwork in some way um and as i did this i started to feel like there was a little bit of a disconnect from how we approach building environments and the way nature actually is in my uh, kind of perspective, nature is very algorithmic, which I, some of you might have strong feelings about that. Nature is an algorithm. But what I mean by that is that everything is connected. Everything is a reason. There's a reason everything is where it is. You know, when we look at, you know, moss on this rock here, there's a logic to how it's placed there. There's a reason that it's growing on the top of the rock and not underneath it or on the side. Um, shapes in nature are follow some logic of some kind and how they grow. This is, everything is just connected. And so when we approach building digital art or building spaces or 3D models, there's sometimes a disconnect between the way that nature is interconnected in this way and the way we approach it which is often, you know, by what we what we would call like hand placing things. You know, we build an environment, we take three D models or shapes, and we 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 come up with an idea and a concept, and we start to extrude it out, and we place it into our environment, and we build it like that. At least that's how I have done it in the past. And I started to feel like this is not really a great way to approach, especially natural environment, which I'm really passionate about because it just doesn't reflect how nature works. Nature is built around these algorithms, these, these logic for how things are placed. And so why are we approaching environments like this, like just dropping things in into a Lego set and building it up like that? Um, so this brings us to procedural content generation which sounds like a super nerdy topic, but we sort of break it down. It's a procedural way to approach design. It's a technique of designing algorithmically instead of manually. Designing algorithmically, algorithmically instead of manually. When I say manually, I mean the act of just placing an object into an environment, the act of taking an object and changing it by hand the 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 act of 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 starting with a concept in some way and then replicating it in your 3d environment the opposite of that is to design algorithmically which is to design a set of rules that you use to populate a 3d world and so you can see an example here of an algorithmically designed jungle we have some points we've derived, some data points we've derived from a path, and that's being used to place trees around it. And then it's and there's rules that are built in here for how the uh, trees should grow and what foliage should be around those trees. It's a set of rules, and the set of rules is building this environment instead of placing trees into it by hand or placing rocks one by one. So it's an algorithmic approach to design. <clears throat> Just to further illustrate this, on the left side, super simple example, but this is like one way of approaching building an underwater environment. We're taking rocks, there are scans of 3D rocks or rocks that we built. We're starting to add it to our environment. This is how I would have done it in the past. I'd, I'd draw the rim. I'm, 
I use my 3D gizmos in whatever 3D software you're using to position them. And I start to build up this environment and adding assets to, to it. And, and it's great. It's fun. It's really fun to do. And, and, and I'm sure a lot of you have approached building 3D environments in this way as well, though. Um, what I started to realize is that by designing a rule set for how to approach this uh, underwater environment, I could build it a lot more quickly and I could build more of it and in, in a much more dense fashion. Um, it's the same models, it's the same rocks, it's the same coral trees and whatnot, but I've designed a, 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 an algorithm for how they're placed instead of individual placement of rocks. Um, and if you think about this, it's kind of starting from a simple place. You're starting with simplicity and you're creating a simple set of rules or approaches and you're using it to build something very complex. You're deriving a lot of complexity in your environment or your design from a very simple set of rules. So in this case, we have some, some cubes and we're using the cubes to derive the shape of our building. And because they're very simple, we can build very quickly. But because we've designed a set of rules, the, the back end of that algorithm is going to populate it with the high res meshes, the, the correct, uh, you know, intersecting um, columns and, and walls and things. And this gives us a lot of freedom because we only need to divine, design the rules once and then we can design infinitely. So we're deriving a lot of complexity out of simplicity. Here's like a very simple example of, of a natural landscape and how you might think about approaching it in rules. Because I realize this is kind of, it can feel a little backwards, can feel a little confusing. I'm really excited about it, obviously, but I'm, I need to kind of pitch to you why this is why this is cool. So this is a simple natural environment on the right side. I built it based on playing Zelda. I got super inspired by that, and I thought I wanted to build an environment based on that. So. This has a very simple set of logic behind it. Nothing in this environment is placed by hand. It's all procedurally generated using these rules. So I have a ground plane, a, a surface that's has some bumps to it look like that look like hills. And I'm sampling points on that landscape. So the first step here is to scatter a bunch of trees, let's say like 20 trees on that surface. Then I'm going to take all the points on that surface again and check if there's a tree where, there. And if it's not, there's not a tree there, I'm going to put grass there. So that's the next step here. We come to the grass placement. Then I'm going to sample the landscape again and or my surface, my ground surface again. And I'm going to check that everywhere that there's grass and it's 10 units away from a tree, I'm going to also spawn flowers. And this is really cool because it's just a simple set of logic, but what it's mimicking is a feature of the natural world, which is that when we have trees and we have sun, they tend to cast shadow. And under the shadow of the tree, flowers don't tend to grow because they need a lot more light than grass does. So we can observe nature, and this is kind of comes back to my love of nature. So you can observe nature and you can start to derive some of these very simple rule sets. And, you know, obviously it's not as complicated as the actual rules of nature. You know, we're, we're, we're abstracting it in, in some senses, but you can see that it creates a very natural feeling without a lot of work. <laughs> um, and you're able to just, to you know, tinker with this rule set until you get it to give you what you want. And then your, your environment can be um, generated. Here's another example. So there's a cave, cave here. It's geometric, um, kind of stylized cave environment. And uh, we can use all kinds of things to derive this data from. So this is an example of using the surface of the cave. Surface of the cave has points on it again. And for each point on that surface, we're gonna check what angle is it pointing? Is it pointing up? Is it pointing down? Is it pointing sideways? you know, 90 degrees. And here we can start to add logic for where different features of our cave will appear. So, you know, 
zero to 20 degrees. If there's a point along the surface that's anywhere from zero to 20 degrees, creates lag mites. I forget which is which. The lag mites pointing up. Then from 20 degrees to 50 degrees, crystals. So we'll only have crystals growing around the edges of our cave as if they've been kind of uncovered from the erosion of the water. Okay. And then from 50 degrees to 150, there might appear some minerals that are peeking through our, our, our walls. And then from you know 160 to 180, that's where we start to get the stalactites coming down like our cave stalactites. So again, very simple logic, but we're able to just create this vast natural environment just by starting to observe where these features might be in, in an actual cave. And then even this in this stylized example I'm using um, here as well, we can create a very natural look. And, you know, this can apply to not just natural landscapes. It can apply to structures as well. It's really just rules. If this, then this. If there's a wall next to another wall, make a column. Or if there's a window, if there's two columns, make a, you know, it could be anything that you come up with and you can use it to create buildings procedurally, natural environments, organic shapes. It's more of an approach to design. And the approach to design is to think about how to design with a set of rules instead of um, by hand. So kind of getting a feel for what this is. We're procedurally generating things with rules. We can create some kind of natural environments or structures with it. but kind of functionally, what does this mean? I mean, I'm a 3D artist. I've worked in film or animation uh, or so, those type of visualizations. Like what does this give me in those contexts? What might it give you in the context of your way of approaching design, uh, of designing interiors or whatever you're applying your digital artwork to? So the difference, one of the, one of the differences, which is really cool, I'm excited about, is that when you design something by hand, it is finite. When you place things into an environment, like in the case of this jungle on the left here, I've I've placed each you know piece of rock or whatever, and when I leave that environment, it ceases to exist. I'm in a void. We all know this. It's a 3D software. You're designing in a void, and you're only going to see the things that you've designed, right? And you know, in the case of a, a film. We would build for a shot, you know, the shots from this angle. There's only, there's a wall here. There's a building there. Okay. We only need to build that. That's all we need to build. And then if you turn the camera, suddenly it, it, it breaks the illusion. When we're designing procedurally like this, we can create an infinite world. So once we have a rule set that works, technically it can just go on forever. So this jungle here on the right side, you could just keep flying forever and just, it would keep being the same jungle, it would be all natural, it would be all varied and different. But if the rule set holds up, it's just going to go infinitely, which is really cool and not something we're used to is in the 3D world because it's so painstaking to build every single little piece. Another aspect of it is that we really only are designing the rules. So the actual assets that you place are arbitrary. So it could be these foliage, could be cubes, or it could be weird 3D scans of yourself. Uh, it doesn't matter because you're just designing real sets. And this is, allows you to play around a lot. And um, I'll get back to a, a reason why this is important later. But again, the only important thing is our little simple set of rules. And then our environment can be whatever we choose. And you can build it with simple models in a stylized way. You could replace it very easily with high definition models. It's very adaptable in that way. Another feature is that our models are not static anymore. So we can see on the left here, I've placed some grass and trees in this Zelda environment again. And when I move them, they just stay where I place them. It's just static. There's no um, intelligence to how they're placed on the surface. Um, and then we come to the right side here, which is a procedural approach, and it will adjust and adapt. 
wherever we place it. It's dynamic, it's intelligent. It will look at the angle of the grass, of the surface, and it will adjust itself because we've designed the rules that way, because it's sampling things that it overlaps with. This is just one approach, but it's um, adaptable and dynamic for that reason. Another feature of this way of working is that it's non-destructive. So when we model things, like if you're sculpting a shape or you're extruding it, you know, as you're working, somebody tells you, oh, I have to come back and change that. You're going to need to remodel it or you're going to need to go push points around and scale it down and re-extrude it and redevelop that asset. Um, but if we work this way, because everything is dynamic, we can very quickly make small adjustments and to adjust how the, how things look. This is really useful when you're dealing with a client who wants to change things like every few seconds. This is really useful if you don't know where your design is going to end up. You have a building, you don't really know, you know what the ground is gonna look like. You don't know how wide it's actually gonna be, but you can still design the, the rule set for the building and then it will adjust itself um, or it's, you know, same with the natural landscape. But this lets you just be a little more free and iterate a lot quicker because, you know, you don't have to worry about rebuilding things because everything is just going to, going to make a change up here in your graph and it's going to do, 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 update everything else. So uh, <laughs> it's just really, it's a little more, it's more fun. It's more fun because of that. So why, why would I choose to use this uh, personally? Like, why, why do I think this is cool? Why, why do I get excited about this? Um, besides these features, which you can see are, are, are really powerful and applicable in a lot of different scenarios. For me personally, when I'm applying this to my own artwork, one of the really exciting things for me is because it allows for exploration. I, in the past, you know, wouldn't have the ability to explore an environment I've built. In this example, you know, I built a rule set for an underwater coral reef. Once I've built the rule set, I can now explore that coral reef as if I'm coming to it for the first time. And that, I mean, I love traveling and exploring, so maybe that's part of it. But in the case of a film, for example, you know, you can now location scout for shots in your film in the environment you've built. That was never the way you would approach it in the past. You would storyboard your shot, you design it, you design the background, that's how you'd approach it. But this is a lot more like how you might in the real world go to a natural environment, look for good angles, pick your shots, you know, location scout would come back with some pictures and be like, hey guys, let's let's do the the scene right here behind this uh this cool rock formation. Now you can actually have a digital environment that you can scout and you know start to pick your shot in the in the case of filmmaking start to pick your shots pick your angles and how to tell your story and for me this is just so much more uh, engaging and tactile and fun to work this way um, as a digital artist uh, making animated films and I will often also take my iPad which is connected to a a virtual camera so I can move the iPad and it will move my virtual camera and I can see what I'm seeing through the camera on my iPad. And I'll just kind of like point it around and look, find good angles for renders. And it just gives you that, um, the, the sort of brain approach that you would take to photography, which you can't really take when you're building a 3D render in the past. You can now approach it that way where you can really look at the space, try some different angles, play with your lenses, you know, you can really find, uh, it's just a very, it's a much more organic way of approaching creating renders. Also, it's just faster to iterate. I think that's probably pretty clear at this point, but I can build so much more as an individual artist than I ever would have been able to before. It's just so much more adaptable and quick that I can just, I can make an entire jungle landscape myself. <laughs> that would not have been possible without this kind of approach to design. 
and this it really empowers me as a, as a single artist to take on larger projects to develop my own projects to be even larger and more ambitious it's just very empowering for me because it equips me with the tools to do a lot more and it's just more fun i think this is uh maybe a peculiarity of me i don't maybe not but the reason I got into digital art in the beginning was because it tickled a certain part of my brain that was very technical, but also artistic. So we have a side of our brain that loves tinkering, that loves design, that loves building, that loves understanding and, 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 and creating something functional. And we have a side of our brain that's more artistic and expressive and creative, and they work together. And so this approach to design really works well with that way that my brain works to the problem solving and the tinkering of coming up with a really beautiful elegant rule set and then the artistic side of how that is expressed through my 3d assets and and it's just really fun for me personally so that's another reason that i tend to use it as well and i guess in conclusion here um i guess i want to challenge you all with this a little bit because you may be approaching your design in, 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 in one direction. And I was for many years approaching my designs in one direction, which is I come up with a concept, I design it. And this is really a different way of designing. And this might look different for you. You might have a, this, when I say, think about your designs differently, it might look different for you. But for me, what this really meant was to think about my designs backwards almost to think, oh, what if I designed a, uh, the parameters of my design and then that created the design instead of designing design uh, from concept forwards, if that makes sense. It's, you're kind of approaching the problem from different angles and this can create some really interesting different results as, as a digital artist, just to kind of rethink how we work and how we approach our work. So for me, procedural design, procedural content generation, is rethinking how we approach environment design, environment art. And in my case, I'm trying to align it closer with the natural world, like I mentioned, how the, the rules of nature work, which are, you know, things are, everything's connected. Everything is, a tree has grown in this part of the forest because of seeds that have fallen from a different tree, which is over here, which fell from a different tree, which is over here. And this grass is growing here for a very specific reason. And this is like, the the cool nerdy part about how nature nature works and so by observing that and kind of incorporating that in my approach to design i can really start to evolve and come up with new ideas that i never would have been able to otherwise so i hope this inspires you to rethink the way you approach design and whether it's with this procedural approach or a different approach um that can be the fun that can be the innovative part of design of animation, digital art in general, is just to rethink how you're doing things with new tools, new approaches. And I uh, hope you uh, enjoyed this talk with me about one that I'm excited about. Um, for me, if you'd like to get in contact with me, you can go to azialarts.com. You can find all my stuff on there. I have courses and YouTube channel, which teaches this stuff for free as well. So if you'd like to learn more about procedural environment art, environment art in general, um, you can find all of my stuff there. Or if you'd like to message me and ask me questions as well after the talk, I'm happy to, to talk with you and, and nerd out about this stuff. But thank you so much for having me. This might be a shorter talk because I talked so quickly because I was so excited. But <laughs> thanks so much for having me. And I really appreciate you taking the time to uh, just take walk through this stuff with me. That is, this is so fascinating. I just mind blowing because uh, so many reasons. One, we love that you love nature. That is absolutely uh, a shared love between uh, people in our department, interior designers and architects do love the environment and try to take care of it. So um, that that holds a special place in our heart as well. So that's really nice to hear of your uh, love of the environment. Number two is that you've taught us about a method and 
and you could see the difference that the when you put when you contrasted your work you could really mm -hmm. see the richness of the second approach mm -hmm. and and the depth of it is just it's overwhelming it's really amazing um but boy thank you for all of that um i'm now going to open it up to the students because they have more important things to say probably than i do mm -hmm. and uh so let's see what questions are out there Our students are generally really good at questions, so I'm sure there's one out there. Don't be intimidated, guys. Let's uh, mm -hmm. let's uh, <laughs> ask a question. Um, do you all use um, any, let's say, like parametric modeling or procedural modeling workflows or tools in, in your own uh, design process? I don't think so. I'm not um, the one teaching our computer courses, but... We, we what... use Grasshopper sometimes. Grasshopper, yep, yep. Thank you, Jackson. It looked a lot like the uh, algorithm uh, sort of string you had. Mm -hmm. Totally, yeah. And so Jackson, could you talk about your last project that you did? Did you use Grasshopper for that? Um, I did not, no. That, it's pretty It's pretty intimidating for me. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, <laughs> but we have tried it and uh, uh, we had a, a, a Rhino class last semester. And we did some grasshopper work mm -hmm. and it is fun. That's yeah. I was great. telling uh, Carol earlier that before we jumped on this, that the old place that I worked, we worked with engineers who used cross sections to design. And then we used a grasshopper, grasshopper script to actually uh, extrude that and test uh, window openings and door openings to make sure they didn't, uh, actually, when they were extruded and they were 3D models, they didn't actually hit into each other. Um, so yeah, very familiar with Grasshopper. And it is, it is, it's like learning to program, but visually. Uh, and so it can be pretty daunting. Uh, so I understand that as as well. I mean, I was pretty daunted when I was first approaching this stuff because I had never, you know, nodes are pretty you haven't worked with nodes, just nodes in general. Like a lot of these procedural tools are very node based. That's how they're, they, that's how they've all collectively decided that this is the way to approach procedural things. And um, so, you know, the, just even seeing a node structure is like, what is happening? <laughs> you, you know, this is not, um... I'm not talking in computer language. I'm going to talk in kind of an analog language, but I'm very rule-based designer. Mm -hmm. And when our students do an analysis of a of an excellent project, you try to give them a list of projects to learn from. And I ask that they analyze them kind of like a biology class where you just isolate the structure. You just isolate the massing, you mm -hmm. isolate repetitive things to unique things. And, and it's a method that I have used since graduate school. And it's part of my brain structure now. But it reminds me a lot of what you're doing. Because if you set up a number of rules, it actually helps you uh, mm -hmm. see, see more clearly when you design. Because otherwise, you're just picking things as you said, and just placing them and you don't have any rules for placing them. Mm -hmm. um, you are kind of the glue between how you did it in a more analog way versus now the rule method because mm -hmm. you have also studied nature. So you've added this sort of second thing in because mm -hmm. you have knowledge about 
how shade would not let a flower grow. And mm -hmm. so you could put those rules in. But I think by being very deliberate about your decisions and how they work realistically, your your final product looked very real um, mm -hmm. and believable. And so I also think in my own analog way that we need to isolate things and put them in certain realistic categories. Like if you're seeing columns, but they really need to be structural, not just fictitious columns. They need mm -hmm. to be probably in a grid. And, and if you isolate them, you can see their characteristics that are part of reality playing out. And then you could start to uh, retain that information as you keep doing more and more things i just i mean i i'm finding a parallel in my own head <laughs> with this yeah but but i think i guess what i'm trying to say is students often say well how do you design like um if you if you have uh, uh a method it helps mm -hmm. yeah and it's the 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 where you're design you're deriving those rules from is really the only difference between this and what you're saying as a more experienced artist or designer, you have internalized a lot of those rules, whether that's structural rules or it's natural rules in this case. Right. You know, an environment artist who's been doing a long time knows instinctively that grass would probably be here. There'd probably be an overgrowth of moss here because the the moisture kind of leaked down the rock, you know, there's probably be, you know, that you start to, and that's all because of, you know, observing reference. And like that, I guess that just takes so many years to develop. And sometimes we think we're better at those rules, at keeping those rules in balance when we're designing something than we actually are. And so this really helps you, like you really just need to spend a lot of time in observation in the case of this nature, or in your case, understanding the requirements of your project. And the better you understand the parameters of what you're designing inside of the more you know efficient and quick you can be with your choices which is really empowering it seems like rules would be like limiting like mm -hmm. oh i don't want those, these rules i don't i want to just make whatever i want but i think as we all develop as artists we start to realize that those parameters are really important even if they're self-imposed parameters that we have to put on ourselves in a pro if it, even if it's a personal project they really help uh, they, they really help direct a design uh, and you'll probably end up at a better result, which is kind of this weird conceptual idea, but it applies in so many direct areas, whether it's a rules from a client or rules in nature. It's kind of funny how it has this kind of universal truth. Yeah. I mean, I, I love those parallels. I think um, the junior students uh, in this group are designing migrant housing, as I mentioned before. And mm -hmm. so when uh, you put up the, that building that sort of grew, it reminded me a lot of what our students are doing and that in order to get kind of to the creative part of housing, you have to first do the map. You have mm -hmm. to have all the units be there. And, and then you can start to, I think, be more creative because mm -hmm. you've, you've got the logic, the logical structure, everything is right there. Um, I did want to ask a question. I was fascinated by the project that I think you showed before or after that, where the plumbing was on the outside of the building. <laughs> and and I and I'm not saying there's anything wrong with that because if you come to our department, we have a few projects up on the wall where the plumbing's on the outside mm -hmm. purpose on purpose. <laughs> and because we wanted to educate the public or that student wanted to educate the public or the people living in the building and the neighbors about what the building was about and that water mm. in this particular case was important. But I was just fascinated about uh, the that one, those images with the plumbing. Oh, yeah, absolutely. I think that is a much more uh, like realistic reason to do that uh, <laughs> i think in that example it was uh, just looked cool 
or looked more cyberpunk <laughs> or would be more visually interesting in the background. But yeah, that's a much better reason to put it on the outside like that. <laughs> oh boy, so so much I've learned tonight. 